Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. I was the white motorcycle policeman. I'm not sure you or I would consider this to be any difference, but to lawyers, there's a difference between influencing the jury, jury pool, which they are not allowed to do, according to legal ethics, and educating the jury pool, which they are allowed to do. So we help them educate the jury pool, which does make a difference on both jurists, the, you know, the, the, the uh, judges, and on potential jury members. So you've come and you've done your analysis, you've done your your review of our systems or our, our, our policies and our procedures, and you present us a, a proven plan. A, pr a plan based on almost 40 years of doing this, yes. How hard is it, now, I'm going to play the devil's advocate, how hard is it to get a hard-charging CEO to stick to a plan when his feet or her feet are put to the fire? Uh, if I have properly trained them in advance, it's not hard. Because in the training process, I will find out whether the likelihood of that CEO being a loose cannon. All right, so <laughs> and I will tell a CEO to his or her face, sir or madam, if you're going to be a loose cannon, you should not be the spokesperson. Outstanding. And you do provide that training. Yes. I do see that on your website. You and your group of folks come out and do that training. And I'm glad that you have the experience and the strength to say, hey, you're not the one. And you've uh, had to do that, haven't you? Now, I, I worked, I worked uh, for one of my clients for seven years was Craigslist. And Jim Buckmaster, the CEO of Craigslist, one of the nicest compliments he gave me was that um, you don't pander to me. Did you hear that, folks in the gun industry? <laughs> Craigslist, you've seen what amazing business they do, and you've also seen how they've been drugged through the mud. All, all of the stuff that we, we took them to Washington, D.C., when they went through the whole allegations of human trafficking, uh, and they eventually dumped that whole section where it was strongly suspected that escorts advertised. Uh, but they fought that for a long time because they felt on First Amendment rights that should be possible for people to have those ads. And all of that preparation is that we did with, with Jim. And not only did they survive, they're thriving now. Thanks oh, they are thriving, absolutely. And let me guess, they have an ongoing plan from you. They, have an, they had an entire process for effective crisis management set up by me, which is they had a, they, as, as the way of accounts everywhere, they had a brand new uh, in-house general counsel come in and he cleaned house, new law firm, new PR firm, hence their former client. But yes, while I was there, they were very well prepared. And I was on the phone with Craig Newmark almost daily. So we've talked to the CEO, you, you've already talked to the lawyers, you have a plan in place. Uh, we have this in a file someplace. And then something happens. And I'm reminded recently of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Salt Lake Bernay, principal ownership. Uh, they changed some laws. They revert back to some Sharia law. The communities uh, against those changes in Sharia law went so hard and fast at the Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, that the best that they could do with all the money available, I know he wasn't your client because all the money available, the best that they could think to do is to shut everything down. They literally went dark for almost 30 days on each of those because oh, I, they didn't have you. And it was a predictable crisis. I said, it, as soon as they decided to change some laws that were going to be unpopular in this country, the reaction was entirely predictable. Just like the reaction to what's going on in Hong Kong and the NBA controversy, completely predictable by each of the parties that have spoken up by LeBron James, by the, the Rockets manager and so on. Entirely predictable. And you mentioned earlier airline websites that get launched when a crisis breaks. Right. Any gun related business should have that kind of website. Any business that thinks it's going to come under criticism, naturally, because of what they do, should have an, uh, a, what we call a hot site ready for launch. If you sell a product that's related to guns, if you sell a holster, if you sell a t shirt, and I'm going to, I'm going to diverge, uh, Patreon. Looking at people's accounts. Hey, you sell shirts that might offend somebody. Merchant moves it to the back page. Patreon, it's still there. Uh, who's PayPal? PayPal is closing some account. Not just closing your account. They're freezing your account for up to 90 days because you are involved in the gun industry. So all of you, it's not just gun makers. Any kind of business, 
if you're in business and you have a potential, if you sell something to somebody, you're at risk. Yeah. So well, have a backup yeah. website. What is the backup website? Six dollars maybe to secure yeah, the name. Yeah, I mean a domain for ten, twelve dollars at most. Creating a basic WordPress site is so easy these days that you know the only cost is if you want to make it look nice. But you know, my, my son who does this for our business the most can throw up a WordPress site in fifteen minutes. It's not difficult to do. And that's 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 worth the the money you spent to watch today and listen, which would cost you nothing. But that's an invaluable point as everything as we've covered so far. So I've you've come in, you've done the audit, you've given me some hard truths. Uh, you've trained me how to be in front of a camera, uh, probably, and to talk and to talk to all of your audiences, whether it's your employees, whether it's you know you're going out to a community meeting, having a open town hall town hall kind of meetings, all of that you can be trained for in advance and learn how to deliver compassionate, confident, competent messages, no matter how much somebody is in your face. Can you say those three again? Compassionate? Compassionate, confident, and competent. We call that the three C's of crisis communication. Why are there three C's? Because I made up the list. That's why there's three C's. Okay. <laughs> how do I, or how does this business owner handle, you know, you have a big company. A lot of people, you know, you stick a camera in somebody's face who's coming out on a lunch break who works in the stock room. They might want to say something. How do you get that word out and how do you mitigate that? We even see that in politics, you know. Oh, absolutely. Or you see, you know, a manufacturing plant fire and the, the reporter is interviewing the, you know, the security guard. Exactly. Because, because when we do a plan and training, we don't just train spokespersons. The entire staff receives some level of training. And the basic training for everybody includes the media relations policy, which should be only so-and-so and so-and-so are spokespersons for this company. If you are approached at any time by a member of traditional or social media and asked about this, all you need to say is, I am not a spokesperson for the company, but I can refer you to someone who is, and then you refer them. And so everybody in the company, except for the spokespersons, <laughs> need to know that phrase. And when they do, it's built into the plan. It's built into the training. It's repeated at refresher training every six months. So people get it in their heads. This is, I'm not a spokesperson and under no circumstances, even if I'm called at home, even if I'm ambushed in the parking lot, I am not a spokesperson. That's my answer. Outstanding. And the phrase, no comment should never come out of your client's mouth. Quite correct. Because no comment has been perpetually associated with I am guilty. I am hiding. Even I tell my clients to just excise the word comment, period, just so from their conversation. And our younger viewers will not know what a London Fog raincoat is. If you've been handcuffed and that raincoat is hiding your handcuffs, don't bring that up to your face because yeah. even in profile, if you're somebody that's in the media, we know who you are even in profile. So there, there are techniques if you're ambushed. I mean, it's I tell I tell my clients to kill the media with kindness. If you're ambushed, or get an ambush, and if you just say, "Look, I'd love to talk to you, but not right here and right now." So let's set up a time, maybe two hours from now, in my office, whatever it is, which gives you time to gather your thoughts, re review your key messages, maybe call me, go over them. Absolutely, then, I think I would be you. Would, I'd be calling you immediately. Uh, well, we we get those kind of calls at four a.m. and two p.m. and because we're the on-call agency for a number of businesses. Outstanding. So I do like that point. It, yes, I like to meet. Yeah, absolutely. Not mm -hmm. here, not now, but you set the time, the place, and the setting. In these interviews, how important is the setting? It, it is important because it and depends on the situation. Sometimes we want to avoid, for example, having a company sign in the background because it just, you know, it just associates, if it's a negative story, it further associates the company's name with the negative story. And they're going to be doing that enough in the media. We don't need to do it for them. And, and, and so, uh, and if you're a CEO, you don't want to come across as a stiff corporate spokesperson, which many of them do. You, and so it's, you want to be seen in a setting you're comfortable. So maybe it's more of a, uh, a, a nice uh, living room type setting and a more casual kind of interview and maybe you know the CEO's not wearing a tie but they're still dressed very comfortably and professionally looking and the other thing it's not always the CEO having the CEO for a really major incident yes but some incidents if you have the CEO it makes the incident seem bigger than it is 
So maybe the CEO for at the onset and then refer at, you know after we're downstream a little bit, then bring in the, the spokesperson. Yeah, and the VP of corporate communications or whoever that is who who does that. And do you do you allow your client? Do you look at lighting? Do you look at the setup? Because if you look at any good interview, at least the ones that I find are good, there are two stable chairs. There's your client and the reporter. There's and stable chairs are important. You you uh, you have probably encountered that literally some media places have uncomfortable chairs. On purpose. On purpose. And when we would do some training, when we when we would borrow a, a local studio here to do training, it had uncomfortable, really uncomfortable forward slanting, make you slide off the chair, chairs. And, and flattering to the commentator. Not, not, not to, exactly. Not but, and, and what you're referring to, though, is an important point that we make in media training. There are only two choices in a media interview about who manages the interview. Either the reporter, which is the default that we give them, even though we don't have to, or we, the spokesperson, manage it. And, and everybody thinks it's the reporter who's got to do it. No, we can manage it. It's entirely up to us. And our, my trained clients ask questions like, how are you going to frame the shot? Are you getting just head and shoulders like, like you are right now to me? Right. You know, are you getting half body? Are you getting full body? Or do you think you'd be zooming in much? You know that we like to, the, report, the good cameramen like to zoom in when you're sweating and make you look bad. Exactly. Which is why when we do training, we look for signs like that. Is does this, does this spokesperson get nervous and start sweating when, when they're interviewed? If so, well, that can be countered in a lot of ways, including some simple makeup. And to, to, to prevent that. So we look at all of that, yes. And if you're dealing with, uh, uh, if you're dealing with a setting that you can control completely, now sometimes you can't. Sometimes the media control is set in, all you can do is make requests. But at least you know what you're dealing with. Do you ask for questions even though you're probably not gonna get a list of them beforehand? We ask, if it's a negative, if, if my client's on the wrong end of the story, uh, we're not gonna get a list of questions in advance. Right. We, the best we'll do is gather some, what, what's the general direction of the story? And even then, they may be lying. Well, of course they yes. yeah, are. Yeah. Nowadays, they've got to make yeah. those things. Yeah, so it's just like you just don't assume that. And you know, it doesn't matter what I tell my clients. It doesn't matter what their questions are because you're not there to answer their questions. You're there to deliver your messages. And no matter, what you, well, no matter what you get asked. Do you hear that? That's one of the many golden eggs we're going to get here. Would you say that again? You're not there to answer You're their questions. You're not there to answer their questions. You're there to deliver your messages. And sure, you can answer their questions too, but it is not your priority. And there's always the option of saying, before I answer that, let me make these points. Point A, point B, point C. I've already gotten three message points out before I even address the question. And then I do that again. And if it's a recorded interview, I keep doing that. Because you never know which portion of the recorded interview they're going to use, and you want to make your message point constantly. So, those of you who are watching, now that you've heard that, you now know who a lot of Jonathan's clients are because you've seen that, especially in the political cycle. You see it in debates, you see it anywhere. These folks do just that, and they repeat it over and over again because what? We don't know when they're going to edit that and how they're going to pull that out. The greatest compliment that the CEO of Craigslist ever gave me was he heard a reporter, uh, I think it was CNN actually, a say, complain after the interview with him. I couldn't get him to say what I wanted him to say. Communication needs to be prompt because in the absence of communication, rumor and innuendo fell to God.